Well, welcome everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us for this issue briefing. It's extraordinary issue briefing, which we arranged just because there was so much interest when the programme was um, released to the public last week that uh, Professor Hariri here um, was, was going to be speaking in the Congress Hall. There was such an intense amount of interest to get him in a smaller, more conducive environment. And I can't think of anywhere more conducive than here in the media centre, uh, all that way from the, you know, the, uh, you know, the busyness and the, the, the hubbub of the Congress Centre, to you know, drill down a little bit more and ask a few more questions and, and try to get a bit more behind um, the professor's work. So, as is the, uh, the norm with issue briefings, we don't have a huge amount of time. It's 30 minutes. Uh, we want to make it as interactive as possible. I'd like as much, um, you know, as much disagreement and challenging of the professor's theories as you can possibly muster. They're quite compelling, and I've been trying and failing. But one thing I will say is I'm glad there is a five-minute walk between the Congress Centre and here, because after his session, I was looking for a, a deep, dark room just to go and kind of <laughs> gather, my, gather my thoughts. I should also say, and I always you know, sometimes forget this, but welcome uh, indeed to our audience watching live online. We're on Twitter, on weforum.org, and a number of other platforms as well. Um, Professor Yuval Hareri, you're a, a professor in the Department of History at mm -hmm. the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, you're, of course, best known for your, for your two books, a Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, I believe, in 2014, and, and followed up swiftly by Homo Deus, um, A Brief History of Tomorrow, which was a year later. Um, I would just ask, uh, I'd like to take advantage of my privilege of being in this position, ask the first question. So you said in your, 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 uh, your speech just now that politicians are a bit like musicians, and they, uh, they have the ability to play on human and emotional and biochemical systems, and they have the power to inspire fear. Now, actually, I, th I find you were similarly able to inspire fear <laughs> myself. <laughs> what I wasn't sure about is, is what your view of the future is, whether you think it's a good thing, whether you're, you know, as a scientist you're quite entranced by its possibilities, or whether you're, you're as scared as maybe some of the other people that left the room. Um, I just don't know. I mean, I don't think that anybody has any idea how the world would look like in 40 or 50 years, let alone a century. The only thing we are certain is that it's going to be completely different from what, what it is today. I don't remember who said it, but uh, somebody said that if, if they tell you about the world in 2050 and it sounds like science fiction, it's probably not true. But if they tell you about the world of 2050 and it doesn't sound like science fiction, it's definitely not true. <laughs> so this is the, the best I can do. I mean, the, the message is that technology is not deterministic. It's not like, okay, now we have AI and bioengineering, so this is going to happen no matter what we do. No, it opens up an entire menu of possibilities and nothing is determined in advance. I, I was, in my, part of my preparation for, for this meeting, as you know, we're, we're, we focus quite heavily on the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. um, here, and it was, a, a, again, popularized in a book, this time by our professor, um, Klaus Schraub, our founder and executive chairman, a couple of years ago. And I was looking to uh, see what the narrative had, you know, had, 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 been, uh, that had followed from this book. And I, in my reading last year, that I found that there were less developments in terms of technology, but more developments in terms of the impacts of technology. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the kind of, the, 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 the kind of thoughtfulness around the need to kind of bake in some kind of system to govern and, and, to, and to try to steer the technology in, in the right way. Um, what is your view of where we're at as, a, as, a, as humanity and kind of trying to understand, as you say, these, these technological leaps that we're kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing before our eyes? Uh, we are making so far very little progress. I mean, most people are hardly aware of what is happening. And even many governments, their basic attitude, ah, we have more urgent things to take care of uh, than this. So as I said in, 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 my, in my talk, um, the world is divided into a very, very small minority of people concentrated in a few corporations and governments that have a clear, or at least a clearer idea of what is really happening and what is at stake. And the vast majority of humanity that they just don't have the, the time, they don't have the volition, they don't have the uh, education or the ability to make sense of, of what is happening. And this is very, very dangerous. In, in the past, you talk about the succession of um, difficult situations humanity has found itself in. If you're on the wrong side of the fence, the, in feudalism or in the industrial age, you're a peasant or you're a worker. And you, we, could in, we could find ourselves on the wrong side of, uh, of, of history again in, the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the, the, the 
the vision that you create? Are we less able um, in the current in this situation we're about to enter to be in charge of our own destiny than we have been in the past? Right, it was always very difficult to be in charge of your destiny. What is unique now is that what people, the big danger for people is no longer exploitation, it's irrelevance. I mean, in the previously in history, if you were on the wrong side of history, if you didn't understand what was happening and you, were, and you, you lost the competition, then you ended up as some kind of serf or manual laborer being exploited by the people who understand and have the power. Now, if you're left behind, you're facing something far worse, which is to be completely irrelevant. They won't even need you as a serf or as a slave. Yeah, which is a, which is a, a worrying thing. And of course, we, for again, we're very concerned about how to, how to find meaningful work and meaningful existence for, for, for folk in the future, including ourselves. Um, one, of the, one of the comments by the moderator of the last session in the Congress Center was that um, Pre uh, Chancellor Merkel um, as she passed you in the, in the green room waiting to go on, mentioned that she'd read your book. Mm -hmm. how, um, how involved have you been working with governments and or other organizations in trying to kind of think out this, this, this next stage of history and try to kind of make sense of it? You also mentioned, a, I think, a, a, a scant respect for the ability of governments to, to put in, in place the long-term thinking as well. Mm -hmm. um, are there any good examples of, of collaborations or, 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 or signs of hope that we're kind of attacking this in the, in the right way? Um. I'm not very involved with, 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 with governments. I mean, I, th I see my job as a historian, and I still regard myself as a historian, basically, as just trying to level the playing ground a bit uh, in the sense of making more people appreciate what is happening around the world, what is at stake, what are the developments we are facing, so that more people can join the debate about the future, which is the future of all of us. If you're not part of the debate, it doesn't mean you won't be affected by the consequences. Um, and I, I have no illusion that we can include all 7.5 billion people in the debate uh, for a variety of reasons. But even uh, um, magnifying the number of people involved by, by 10 times, it's still something that we should uh, aspire to. And this is what I see as, as my role as a historian, just to create more clarity for people and to thereby empower them to have a voice in, in this debate. And how, what kind of response are you getting from people? Is, the, is this a slow burn? We talk a lot here again about shifting mindsets, which is mm -hmm. never as fast as one would like. Do you feel that mindsets are being shifted or, or is this uh, still, um, still too early to say? No, they, they are shifting, but uh, the the pace of progress of what we're talking about, especially the disruptive technology, is much faster than the pace in which minds shift. I and mean, it's very, very difficult to really change the minds of people. Which goes back to your comment that we don't know our bodies as well as algorithms <laughs> yeah. may soon know our bodies. Let's have a quick show of hands, see who wants to ask questions. Okay, so we have a couple here. All right, let's, let's start then. Please uh, wait for the microphone. If you could remind us who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Alec Hogg from biznews.com. Uh, there, there are many questions, but uh, I'll throw two at you and maybe you could mm -hmm. answer both of them. The first is some kind of an update from Sapiens on the two big lies, markets and the state. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is we're in the media. People are uninformed. 50% we heard from Edelman's don't consume media anymore. How can we change that? Um, so about markets and states, they are still the, 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 main, the main actors, the main agents in, in history. Um, we don't have a new agent so far. And um, I don't think that it's going to change uh, anytime soon. The two big processes is states trying to accumulate more power and markets trying to uh, accelerate the, the pace of growth. This is what is pushing these revolutions uh, forward. And this will continue. Anybody who tries to get off this train, I mean, unless the whole human race gets off the train at the same time by some common agreement, then you'll just be left behind. I mean, if, if, if some state says, oh, I don't want to, to go on with, with, with these kinds of, of developments, 
uh, while other states continue with business as usual, then it will just be left behind and no state is willing to, uh, to, to do that to, to, to itself. As for media, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand the question. I mean, if you can just rephrase it. Media, sorry. At the, at the Edelman's Trust Barometer yesterday, uh, it came out that 50% of people are no longer consuming media at all. They don't believe Any in kind it. of media. Any kind of media. And the 50% that are consuming them, three, two thirds of them don't know what the difference between fake news and proper news. Mm -hmm. Now, we are presumably in the business of trying to inform uh, anti-fake news. Have you got any thoughts of how one um, as a historian, I don't really understand the, uh, the, the, the uh, maybe hysteria around fake news because this was always the case. I mean, when was the era of truth? In the 1980s, the 1930s, the 18th century, the Middle Ages? When was it that everybody consumed just truthful stories, <laughs> that governments didn't lie, that propaganda didn't play a central role? Um, I, I think that in some ways, the situation is, is better now than it was. I'm, I'm a medievalist, so I tend to look at everything through, through the prism of, of the Middle Ages. And believe me, the Middle Ages was full of far worse fake news than what we are seeing today. I think that the really big problem is the flood of information of any kind. Whether, I mean, even the truth is problematic when you're just flooded by enormous amounts of truthful but irrelevant information or too much information to, to, to make sense of and to create uh, some kind of meaningful picture. The real, what we re are really missing is not, not just the ability to tell the difference between what's true and not, what, what's not true, it's the ability to make sense of, of the big picture. This is the, the real difficulty and in this sense, the problem with media is not so much whether that the stories are, are, are true or not. It's just that um, it's, to what extent does the media focus on really helping people to have uh, an understanding of the big picture? Or is it just focused on pushing the, the next story? It doesn't matter if the story is true or not. That's, the, that's, for me, is the real issue. Which is interesting because you mentioned uh, a, a kind of slight distrust of governments mm -hmm. to, to put in place the kind of long-term thinking you're talking, and a slight distrust of the media for putting across that bigger picture. Um, this is a multi-stakeholder embracing organization and meeting. What, what stakeholder groups are best positioned to, to, to do this kind of long-term thinking that we need to do? Uh, it would be easy to say science, but that's too easy because when you don't have responsibility, then yeah, you can have all kinds of ideas and theories and, and talk big. Um, I don't think that a government of scientists ruling the world will necessarily uh, do a better job. Uh, we d what we need is not to get rid of the state, so get rid of the corp corporations, but to get them on board and to work with them and, and, and through them. Uh, gentlemen on the front row, let's move on to, to you, sir. You please wait for the microphone. So if we as a species are changing... Can you just remind us? I yeah, know, I'm, I'm, I know Vikram, I'm Vikram Chandra from NDTV. Um, if you said that, the, that we as a species are changing and the era of sapiens might be coming to an end, since you wrote Homer Deus, have you, have you thought any further as to what could be coming and what sort of a, a entity is likely to replace sapiens? Um... That's an impossible question to answer because given the ability to re-engineer bodies and brains and minds, then our imagination too is up for grabs. So I can tell you what sapiens like us would like to do with things like bioengineering or direct brain-computer interfaces. They would like to extend their lifespans to be more healthy, to be more beautiful and so forth and so on. But once you change the basic parameters of, of the human brain and of the human mind, I have absolutely no idea what the new kinds of entities would like to do with these technologies. 
I mean, so far in history, what we have seen is humans, just like us, changing the world outside them. So they cut down forests, they build bridges, they, they, they build factories, all kinds of things. But the real change now is that we are gaining the ability to start re-engineering not the world outside us, but the world inside us, inside the body and the brain. And um, by definition, you don't know where this is leading because you're still stuck with your brain. So if you can imagine what the future entities will do with the technology, they are not superior to you. They are just like you. And what are the first ways we'll see this happening? What are, give us some kind of uh, first baby steps towards kind of infiltrating the, you know, the inside of the body rather than the world around us. What, should we, what do we need to look out for? Um, it, it's happening on, on three fronts. There is biological engineering which is taking the body as we know it, as natural selection uh, shaped it, and basically speeding up natural selection with all kinds of, 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 of help from intelligent design. Uh, and we are beginning to see uh, all kinds of interventions on the genetic level, all kinds of interventions with the growing new organs and, and uh, uh, re re uh, rejuvenating organs and so forth. So this is one front, biological engineering, which is the most conservative because it still stays with the basic building blocks of organisms as we have known them for four billion years. Okay, so they change a few genes and you have a different brain, but it's still an organism as we, know, as we have known it. The second approach is more radical, and this is to start combining organic and inorganic stuff. So direct brain computer interfaces, replacing uh, organic hands with bionic hands, uh, adding to the body a second immune system, which is not organic, but an inorganic immune system uh, made up of millions of tiny, tiny nanorobots inside your body that diagnose cancer and, and eliminate all kinds of, of diseases and so forth. Uh, but you still, the, the main command and control center is still your organic brain, which is connected to all kinds of devices or computers, can serve the internet, whatever. The third and most radical way is to completely give up, completely uh, abandon organic stuff and create completely inorganic life forms. Whether this can be done or not is an open question. Uh, the biggest open question as yet so far uh, in, the, in the life sciences is the question of consciousness. We have no idea what consciousness is, what it does, how, how it emerges. The common assumption is that somehow the mind, consciousness, emerges from the brain. And if we hack the brain, and if we understand how billions of neurons create subjective experiences of anger and love and pain and pleasure, then there should be no barrier for recreating these kinds of experiences based on silicon and not carbon, based on uh, uh, computers and not brains. But this is just... At present, it's just a dogma. We are still far from really understanding consciousness, so maybe it's not like that. And maybe we'll never be able to create non-organic life forms. But uh, more and more uh, scientists, serious scientists, uh, are becoming convinced that sooner or later this will happen and we'll be able to leave behind the uh, realm of organic compounds and create completely inorganic uh, life forms. I've seen a couple of hands go. Maybe we should just uh, take the questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll take them in a row. Lady, um, lady at the front row, Mom, if you wouldn't mind giving us your name and first. Hi, I'm Pia Mancini from Argentina. I have a question that you talk about markets and the state. I was wondering if you see any role in the future for the networks mm -hmm. and specifically um, what are your thoughts on the blockchain mm. as a mechanism to organize human cooperation at scale that maybe previously was only able to be done <coughs> by states or markets? Mm -hmm. And a cheeky one, what are you hopeful about? Okay, well, let's just see the gentleman over there and give you some time to think about that oh. one. Hi, I'm Marcelo Nins from Global News TV Brazil. 
Uh, I've heard Mr. Jack Ma from Alibaba, uh, his thoughts about education, what would need, that the world would need a revolution in education to be prepared for the loss of jobs to computers and robots. He talked about 800 million jobs being lost in the near future. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have your take in what needs to be done in education because it always uh, seems that we are educating looking at the past and not at the future. And he says that the more important things nowadays to separate clearly humans from robots. So teaching kids music, sports, and uh, painting, let's say, to make them very different from robots. I'd like to have your say on education. Anybody else mm -hmm. while we're doing a round of questions? Yeah, gentleman in the front row. Jeremy Rome from Israel. Um, I'd love to know how you see these three sects or these three movements um, playing out in the near term, uh, maybe a decade or two, something that you feel you do have some analytical visibility into. Okay, I mean so the three ways of <laughs> the uh, organic mix. Mm -hmm. Biohumanism, neurohumanism, and posthumanism. Let's just okay. do the gentleman in the last row, then we'll take all these. Mm -hmm. You can choose which one you want to do first. <laughs> uh, Rick Wiles, True News, Florida, USA. In the earlier session, you said, uh, there is no intelligent design by a god in the clouds. Could you elaborate on those thoughts? Okay, so we have uh, blockchain, the power of networks for facilitating human cooperation. Mm -hmm. Education, revolution in education. Yep. Um, timeline, of the three stages. God in the clouds, and last but not least, what, what makes you hopeful? Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't, don't so, run out of time before you get to that last question, please. Okay. So about uh, markets and states and blockchain. I mean, basically we've been there before in the 1990s. Uh, in the, the, the great optimistic era of the internet. And then we, we, we heard the same story that all oh, states, the markets, corporations, this is old stuff. The internet will completely change the way things are happening, will create all kinds of digital communities that will uh, replace states and corporations and markets. And as we all know, it didn't happen. What happened was that the corporations, the markets, and the states colonized cyberspace and are now becoming more and more powerful and they now compete among themselves. It's states against states against corporations. And so now we have this new promise, okay, the, the old internet was not good enough to do it, blockchain will do it. And maybe it will happen. I mean, history is never just repeat itself. The fact that something happened last time is no guarantee that this will happen again this time. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I, I'm skeptical because the states and the market have been here for such a long time already, and they have managed to adapt to so many different new environments that I'm, I'm, I find it hard to imagine that just, you just need one more technological twist and, the, and they are out of the game. They, some of them may become extinct, but others will adapt and uh, take over also the new technology maybe. So this is about uh, uh, the promise of, of blockchain. About education, then yes, I mean, it, this is the, the, the really big question with all the talk about job loss and so forth, is it's not the absolute annihilation of jobs. There will be new jobs. The big question is whether people will be able to perform these new jobs, whether they will have the skills. Because usually when people talk today about the, the coming waves of automation and the creation of new jobs, what they think about is jobs that demand um, uh, specialized, uh, not specialized, but more highly proficient skills. Jobs that re create, uh, demand creativity and innovation and things like that. And okay, so you have these millions of, of jobs that demand that, but do you have the necessary education and skills to fulfill the jobs? In the previous waves of automation, let's say if you're a farm worker in 1910, and they don't need you anymore because they now have these new tractors, but there are, there are openings in the tractor factory in Detroit. So you move from the farm to Detroit and you apply to the tractor factory, and it's, it's a routine manual job, so you do need to learn some new skills, and you do need uh, some time to adjust, but in principle, most farm workers were able to reinvent themselves 
as factory workers relatively easily. But in the next stage, in the next waves of automation, if you lost your job as a cashier or as a textile worker, and there is a new job in data analytics or in designing virtual reality games, that's going to be far more difficult. And we are not teaching young people today the necessary skills for the simple reasons that nobody knows what these skills will be. We can't predict what will be the necessary skills. So the best bet is to focus on things like emotional intelligence, like mental resilience, like the ability to learn, because this will definitely be necessary. The problem here is that nobody really knows how to teach it on a, on a massive scale. You can create a very innovative school that focuses on things like emotional intelligence and things like, um, uh, like uh, mental resilience. But how do you scale that for billions of people around the world? This is a, a, big, a big question. Uh, about the, the, the three ways, the three ways in which this is, is, is going to, to play out. Um, so we see it beginning to happen in different ways uh, around us today. Genetic engineering is no longer just science fiction. I mean, every month or so, we hear about a new treatment, a new experimental method on mice or on monkeys or sometimes on people, which is, which is being explored. And it's the same with uh, brain-computer interfaces. Uh, now, for example, the idea of just thinking about something and the lights go out or the, the, the something appears on the computer screen, this is no longer science fiction. It's happening. Once we have a, um, a good two-way communication system, direct communication system, between brains and computers, this is kind of a, the, the watershed moment. I mean, once you have a good two-way, nobody has any idea what happens after that. It's kind of like the, 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 uh, the screen comes down and a completely different show begins. For example, if you have um, uh, a good two-way communication system directly between brains and computers, it also means you can connect several brains together to create an inter-brain net. With a comp because it's, it's the, same, the same system, the same communication system. And nobody has any idea what this means for things like identity. Who am I when I can access directly the brain of another person? The third uh, way of creating completely inorganic uh, life forms, this is still science fiction. Oh, of course, it depends on your definition of, of, of a life form. But if you wanted to have consciousness, if you wanted to have subjective experiences, then this is still science fiction. And maybe there'll be a breakthrough in the next decade or two. Maybe it will never happen. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the fourth question was about uh, God in the intelligent design and gods and, and clouds. So I, I was just referring to it, that um, the word intelligent design immediately brings to mind of many people the creationist idea that all life forms are designed by God. And, and I, sometimes people tell me, don't use the word intelligent design. But it is intelligent design, what we are about to see in the world. It's just not the intelligent design of, of, of the God of the Bible. It's the intelligent designs of human beings and increasingly of, of algorithms. This is why I referred to the intelligent design of clouds, of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the cloud computing. That designing a life form is such a complicated thing to do that in all likelihood, no human being will be able to do it. But our algorithms may be able uh, to do it for us. And increasingly, we'll see in more and more fields this shift in authority from humans to algorithms so even if we keep as figureheads, the presidents and the CEOs will continue to be human beings because we don't like the idea of being ruled by algorithms. Actually, these presidents and CEOs, they will be choosing between options dictated by algorithms, often without really understanding how they came to these options and what do these options mean. 
So you'll still have uh, some human being being given the option, okay, we'll do A, B, or C, but the ones really driving the show will be the algorithms that shape the options in the first place. And the last Quick, question was about... Quick, before we run out of time, what yeah. gives you hope? Uh, that humanity has managed to uh, overcome very big challenges in the past as well. If you look back, say, 50 years, in the 1950s, 1960s, the nuclear war was on everybody's like number one item on the human agenda. And lots of people were convinced that uh, humanity is not up to it, and that sooner or later the Cold War will end in a nuclear catastrophe that will annihilate all of humankind and much of the ecological system uh, as well. And so far it didn't happen. The Cold War ended not in some huge bloodbath, but actually ended peacefully with some eruptions here and there, but generally speaking, it, it, if you think about previous similar crises in history, it was the most peaceful transition of power maybe in, in human history, what happened at the, at the end of the Cold War. And um, this was not a miracle. This was human beings making wise choices. Uh, the Soviets, the Americans, the Chinese, the Europeans, they made wise choices during the Cold War and it ended peacefully. It gives us no guarantee that we can do the same thing uh, in the, w w in, with, with the challenges that we now face, but it does give us hope that yes, um, uh, human stupidity is unlimited, but so is hopefully also human wisdom. I'm, I'm reminded of the, the fact that I believe it was after the first nuclear bombs were dropped mm -hmm. that we managed to get a human, uh, a, a treaty for the non-proliferation of, of nuclear weapons. Yet still, I'm with you, I'm hopeful. Um, <laughs> good news, guys, we have an extra 15 minutes. Oh. We've given the Professor here more time than we normally give. So, um, so we can have some more questions. And just to give you some time to kind of think about this, I'm sure you've had plenty. Um, we haven't really talked about business much. And it's... Uh, uh, it's I don't know how to make money. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but exactly. So let's just, really, let's see, but before you do, you talk about states and governments, but also vast owners of data these days are businesses. So my question I'd like to ask is, can they be trusted more than governments to be safe custodian, responsible custodians of this mm -hmm. data? And do you think that the owners of this data today will be the owners of data as we move into this, this, this future that you're painting for us? No, not necessarily. I mean, those who own the data today, there is no guarantee that they will continue to own it, especially as more people and especially governments wake up to the importance of this data, uh, they might want to grab it, to nationalize it. Actually, one of my fears, when, when I was thinking about what to talk when I, they invited me to Davos, and I was thinking about giving this talk, my main fear was that it will be considered as a call to nationalize the data. And uh, even though I, I, I think there are many reasons to distrust corporations, that at least in the West, in, in, in China it's different, but at least in the West, today the main owners of data are the big corporations, I'm not, I don't, I'm not convinced we'll be better off if the governments nationalize this data. Uh, again, as I said, I don't have a solution. I think it's, it's, it's really too early. The discussion is, is, is just beginning. Well, let's take a couple more questions. So quick, this is the last round, I promise you. So three people, there are four. My question was actually your question about the data. Merkel said uh, the crucial question is uh, who, who, Europe has to decide who owns the data. And so I wanted to ask you whether it's better if a corporation owns the data or a government and what scares you more. Hmm. Okay, so and well, let's do these four in a row, and that's it. So, lady, Mom, if you could give us your name as well, and if you don't mind. Uh, my name is Anne Wright, and I was wondering, you know, independent of the question of who owns the data, have you thought at all about um, how requirements might be put in place so that people will have access to their own data? Hmm. An example is that Axiom and other data aggregators have the sophisticated data model that they use to ad advertise towards you, which it would be really, really, really nice if you could see, you know, well, what, what, you know, what do what they model, know about you? Yeah, what, what do they know about me? What is their model of me? So that you can, you can challenge that mm -hmm. and so that you can audit that. Um, have you thought about that? Hmm. Great. Pass the microphone behind you, please, Mom. Um, could you give us your name and where you tell us where you're from, please? Um, I'm Wendell Wallach and I'm from Yale University. 
from the Hastings Center. So you've written, particularly in the more recent book, but, but also in some of the futuristic aspects of, your, of uh, your first book, you've written a lot of ideas that have been around. There's really a large community of people who've been thinking about this. And I, in addition to bringing some good insights and some a kind of balanced account, um, an awful lot of what you did or accomplished was just wonderful writing and organizing it in, in a refreshing way. And I was just interested in who you drew upon, because, because there is this large community of scholars out there involved in this, and I just wondered who your inspirations are, who you found particularly helpful, um, whose ideas you were inspired by. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, next to you, please. Yeah, I'm Li Wei from Caixin, from uh, China. So uh, mentioning about governments, you repeatedly uh, mentioning China. I'm wondering, do you mean it in a, say, negative sense, as Jillian Ted mentioned earlier, digital uh, dictatorship, or in a positive mm -hmm. sense that Chinese government have the capability to do things, specifically on uh, these tech giants, uh, Chinese society's recognition of their kind of negative impact is lagging behind uh, Western society. But it seems the monopolistic effect on the society of these two tech giants are ahead of the West. Mm -hmm. So do you think Chinese government can do it mm. before things blow up? <laughs> Not a great choice of words, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so we've got China Digital Democracy, uh, Inspirations, Access to Data. And, and, and Mom, your question wasn't quite answered earlier about... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll address... All so I'll address the, the, the first and the last questions yeah. together. Uh, about China, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find this middle way. Um, my basic message is not that the Chinese are worse than everybody else or that they are better than everybody else. Uh, my basic understanding is that they are ahead of all the other governments in understanding what is happening and what is at stake. And um, again, this can be something very good because they are thinking about these issues and they come up with solutions before uh, people in other countries realize that the dangers, or it could be bad, that they are learning how to manipulate it and how to use it. So it's, it, it can go uh, uh, either way. At present, and again, I'm not an expert on, on the subject. I haven't studied it deeply enough. The only thing I can say is that they are probably ahead of our other governments in understanding the importance of in actions, I don't know what they do in, 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 in actuality. So this I, I cannot comment on. But at least from, what I, from meetings I had and discussions and, and what I read, the impression is that they really understand what is happening in a way that in the West you talk to people both in governments and sometimes also in business, and they, they, they are somewhere behind. They, they think they don't realize the immense power that again, most of their thinking is really about the, you know, shopping and consumerism, and if Amazon knows that I like this, they can sell me that, and this, everybody knows, almost everybody knows that by now. But the more important stuff, that they can know things far more important about me, and they can manipulate far, more imp far deeper aspects of my personality and life, this is still something that, at least in the West, people are, are not aware of, or not aware of enough. Now, this brings us to the question of, okay, so if you have to choose between corporations and governments, uh, what do you choose? It's very difficult. On the one hand, governments at least represent people, or supposed to represent people, uh, beyond the shareholders and, 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 the, and, and the managers, whereas the big corporations, nobody really voted for them or, or endorsed them in, in any public way uh, to, uh, to, to take hold of, of these developments and of, of the future of, of humanity. So from this perspective, it's better if the data is in the hands of governments, who also thinks in, in broader terms they have the mandate to think not just about profitability, but about social issues and about health and about the environment and many other things that corporations are, this is not their business. Their business is just business. It's just the bottom line. 
So from this perspective, it's better if the governments nationalize the data. On the other hand, um, governments can do, because they have a broader perspective, they can do far worse things with this data than the corporations. I mean, the corporations, okay, so they'll make a few more trillion dollars. But what all kinds of, uh, of despotic regimes might do, I mean, if, if you really build a digital dictatorship based on uh, biometric sensors and biometric data, there is no way that it can be dismantled from within. It's the end of the line. I mean, all these liberal fantasies about people making revolutions and rising up, they are a hundred steps ahead of you. They know what is happening in your brain before the thought is even formulated. And they can manipulate you on a far deeper level than just, you know, George Orwell and then the brain propaganda machine of, the, of the, the, the kind they had in the 1930s and 40s. So this is really the, the, the scary scenario. Once you go there, um, there is almost no way of, of getting out of there. So this is why it's, it's really scary if the governments uh, uh, get their hands on, on this. Can we, can we do a quick show of hands to see who would prefer to have governments in control as opposed to business? Gov who's, who's for governments <laughs> only your data? L lady in the t <laughs> two, two oh, and a half, the, the three horse. and a half. <laughs> any takes on three and a half. <laughs> business. Um, uh, seven or eight, ten, business wins. Does mm. it surprise you? Oh. But none is, I mean, none. so where is it? All right, none. Well, somebody other than business. <laughs> 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 Again, geos are different. I mean, there's actually a, a European uh, a search engine mm -hmm. that actually uh, promised not to track personal data. Um, where are you from? You never give us your name, please. Uh, my, my name audience. is Giuliana Ferraina, and I'm a journalist, Corriere della Sera, Italy. Mm -hmm. So yes, we, we can think about third options, but a, a, as we discussed earlier, uh, I mean, this is a lot of power we, we're talking about. If you establish some, I don't know, NGO that accumulates the data, it will become the most powerful organ in, in the world. Um, and then the, the state, either the states and the corporations will try to get the power back or the same problems you have today with governments and with uh, corporations you will have with this NGO. I mean, the option of just not using the data, it means giving up on all the enormous potential. And here, the, as I said in the talk, the most obvious uh, front is, is healthcare. I mean, think of the kind of healthcare you could provide to people if you really know what is happening every moment inside their bodies and inside their brains. Now, would you like to give it up? Because you're afraid of the other things that this kind of information might make possible. My guess is that most people, especially when it comes to life and death situations affecting themselves or their children or their spouses, would not like, would, would take the risk. I mean, healthcare will win. And in the wake of healthcare, we'll have all the other things uh, making use of, of this data. Eva, let's, let's move on. We have yeah. a couple more minutes left. Uh, access to your own data and inspirations in whatever order you like. Yes, so access to data, this is a, a very good idea. I think from the things we can implement, then, okay, so there's, there's, there's a lot of data about me. I want to have access to know what they know. This is a very good idea, hard to implement. How to implement especially because most of the data would not make any sense to you unless you have the tools to, to uh, I mean, if they give you all the data about like, you can today get your DNA scan. What does it mean? I mean, you need an entire system to make sense of, 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 of data like your DNA scan. So, uh, so this is one issue. You need the system and not just the raw data. And the other thing is that um, I mean, you know, f throughout history, the, the, the uh, repeated advice that all the philosophers and prophets and poets told people is, is get to know yourself, know thyself. And this is very, very difficult, uh, partly because people often don't want to know themselves very well. There are many things you don't want to know about yourself. 
if you really had access, not just to the raw data, but to what the data means about you, this will be a life-shattering event to really know who you are. It's not necessarily bad, it's just very difficult. Difficult not in the sense of, of how to make it happen. If it happens, it will be something very difficult for people to deal with. Um, and, I mean, the, the, again, the kind of consumerist idea, in the same way they give me the report about my bank transaction, every month they'll send me a report, oh, what we learned about you this month. Um, this will be a shuttering report. And, so, and, your, and your inspirations? Oh, in, inspirations. Uh, I, I read so much. I mean, it's so difficult. I mean, I'll mention just, just a few. Uh, there was Jared Diamond, who first gave me the, the idea that historians and, 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 uh, and scientists can talk about these issues seriously from a scientific perspective. Uh, and there is Franz Deval, who is a primatologist. He studies chimpanzees and bonobos and, and, and so forth. And I've learned from his work more about humans, I guess, than about only chimpanzees and, 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 and bonobos. And there is a long list uh, of, of, of other, I, I just, I'm... <laughs> we are running out of time. Yeah, so... Um... <laughs> Thanks, Alec. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I leave it at, at, at there. But uh, it's, it's a very long list. I mean, I, definitely I would say most of my work is not creative. It's, it's a work of synthesis. I read what people write about chimpanzees and about artificial intelligence and about ancient China and about uh, brain science. And I try to bring it together in such a way that it will uh, be meaningful for the average person. And it will be helpful and empowering to understand what is happening in the world. Final question for me before we leave. So you've written a brief history of humankind. You've written a brief history of tomorrow. Uh, Professor, you're a, you're a young man. What, what's next? <laughs> where, from, um, where do you go from here? The next book is really about the present. I mean, we've done the past, we've done the future, so the present is the only thing that is left. So this is, the next book is... Fascinating. Well, what a vivid description you've given us. And uh, by, by far one of the most interesting sessions that I've uh, had the pleasure. Not this one, the earlier one. I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for joining us and watching us online. This session is Thank over. You.